to get started. But I, I think now's a good time to, to get started with the first uh, Hong Kong Graphene Meetup, uh, which is very exciting. So <laughs> thank you for the support. <laughs> um, essentially, tonight is more of a, an introduction uh, to an, uh, like the graphene technology itself, some of the, pro the projects that are running on graphene, and uh, maybe a little bit of discussion about maybe how it works or um, I know that there's technical people in the audience, but there's also non-technical people. So I want to keep it kind of general so that, you know, everybody has something to participate. Basically, if you're interested in, um, you know, anything of the, the new technology side of things, the blockchain side of things, cryptocurrency side of things, I think this is a really good place uh, to, to be right now. So uh, let's, let's, let's kick it off. So essentially what we've got is um, a bit of an agenda for tonight. Just gone through it. We're going to talk a little bit about the, uh, yes, I've plugged it in. It's all good. Uh, so I think we're going to hold this once a month as well. Uh, we'll be talking about different topics maybe each month. So there's going to be topics which I'm going to introduce tonight, like a decentralized exchange, uh, like say smart contracts, like say uh, BitShares, EOS, Steam, um, decentralized social networks, some of these really cool concepts. We might have dedicated meetups for this. So, you know, feel free to uh, comment on the meetup.com group if you want to see any specific kind of things. But that's what we want to do is once a month run a meetup like this in a place like this. I think it's pretty easy to get to. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's close to an MTR and it's on the blue line. So it's all good. Um, we, we're going to be collecting a lot of uh, speakers from the industry as well. People who are running their projects on graphene tech. Uh, can, can come along and we can introduce to the group and uh, and then yeah we're, it's essentially to have fun and network so we're gonna have a lot of people from a lot of different places I've already spoken to some of you here tonight um, some of you are from different industries not related to Bitcoin and blockchain and all this kind of stuff some of you are totally into that that's what you do every day you wake up in the morning so uh, so so we can talk about and connect with uh, with a lot of different people from diverse backgrounds so that's that's very exciting so I guess to, to, to kick it off, what is graphene? What am I even, what am I even talking about here? Why are we here? Um, graphene is a technology of which is, it's a blockchain technology and a lot of blockchain cryptocurrency projects are running on this blockchain technology called graphene. And some of the prominent ones are say EOS, BitShares and Steam, which you may have heard of. Uh, the actual technology itself is, has been around for four years it's much like, I mean, people were familiar with Bitcoin. Bitcoin's a cryptocurrency. Uh, Bitcoin was founded in 2009 by Satoshi Nakamoto. And then ever since then, there's been other blockchain projects that have sprouted up, and Ethereum as well as a number two. And people usually build stuff on top of, say, Ethereum as a technology layer, and they can build other things on top of it, whether it's business cases, smart contracts, these sorts of things. Graphene is the same kind of deal. Um, and in fact, many people are looking to it as it, it is the next Ethereum. Um, there's a lot of people sort of talking about that with things like EOS. So, uh, so I mean, it's not new. It's been around for quite a while. Uh, it has a lot of intrinsic benefits over some of the existing technology types. And essentially at these meetups, we're going to talk about all of the different projects which, which utilize this tech because it's actually very exciting. So. There are some other uh, projects that use graphene as well. We've got peer plays, you own your own words, uh, and Muse. Basically, they're people who are using the technology to do different things. Uh, I think Muse and, uh, and peer plays are more around like a music database. So when you, uh, you know, issue music as an artist, somebody could just download any music and they can pirate it for free and not pay you. So it's all about uh, in order for me to actually get your music in the first place. I need to know and identify who's uh, downloading it so I can do that on blockchain because every unique identifier is unique. So there's a lot of these other projects around which, uh, which sort of use uh, graphene tech but they're sort of smaller. But I think tonight I'll talk about the big three. Um, and essentially who am I as well? I might, I might mention that. Um, I'm George. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Bitspark here in Hong Kong. We're a fintech company, been around for about four years. And we were the first in the world to do cash in, cash out money transfers using Bitcoin uh, as a technology mechanism to transfer that money. We've now since made the switch to graphene and BitShares in order to conduct our remittances. So essentially, we provide software to money transfer companies to send and receive payments. These money transfer companies are like your physical Western unions. They're a physical shop. They're accepting cash. They send to a lot of countries around the world, cash in, cash out. These shops, they don't understand crypto and Bitcoin and all these crazy things. 
they just want to send money. So we just make it easy for them in order to actually send the money. And we use uh, cryptocurrencies behind the scenes to do the settlement in the different currencies. So, uh, you know, we've been doing that for a long time and we've now starting to build our project. We're moving away from Bitcoin as the, as the mechanism of sending money to using BitShares. And there's a couple of reasons why. I'll talk about that a little bit when we get to, when we get to BitShares. But essentially, just a, a, bit, a bit of an intro uh, about some of these projects. Well, firstly, what is Graphene? Um, here's some statistics for some of the uh, technical people in the room. Uh, the consensus mechanism is, is how blocks are validated. So, I mean, that's a fancy way of saying, how do we know things are true or not? Uh, in Bitcoin, we have a thing called mining. If people have heard about mining before, uh, mining is where a lot of people around the world are running computers that are running, say, the Bitcoin core application. And what those computers do is they verify transactions if they're legitimate or not. So if I send a Bitcoin to Kevin, uh, I need to verify that that, I'm not going to send you a Bitcoin, by the way, the price is too expensive. Um, oh, you got me excited there. <laughs> Just Kevin, just Kevin. Uh, so if I do that transaction, how do we know that I didn't just make it up? Uh, that I actually had that one Bitcoin to send in the first place? The purpose of mining is that we don't need some centralized authority to tell us if a transaction is successful or not. We have a lot of computers around the world who are do doing a lot of complicated mathematics in to, to determine if the numbers add up, that I had that Bitcoin to begin with, you know, and I was able, uh, you know, uh, mathematically exist on the blockchain and I've sent it to another place and that place exists. These computers check this stuff, that's mining. And essentially the mechanism that they do that is that in Bitcoin they get rewarded for all of this hard work. Like why would computers just do this? Like why would people run, run this software? Like what's the point? Well, it's because they get paid to, you know, that they make money, it's profitable. So that's why people do it, because they make money. So uh, in BitShares and uh, you know, EOS and Steam, it's the same kind of thing. You, you get paid to validate blocks and this consensus mechanism that they use is called delegated proof of stake. In, uh, in, in Bitcoin, you have a lot of miners who buy a lot of hardware and uh, maybe a lot of people with a lot of hardware you know, end up with a large share of the network. Delegated proof of stake, I'll show you some slides in a moment, is a very efficient and uh, decentralized mechanism of being able to prove that. Essentially, decentralization is generally what you want to aim for as a cryptocurrency. Um, so. If you have more decentralized block validation, as in, if I just verified every single transaction on the network, you just have to trust me, George Harrop, right? Maybe you don't trust me, that's fine. But you probably wouldn't put all your money just with me. You'd want to have some sort of, uh, you know, reasonable checks and balances on that. So having that more efficient and more quick and everything like that is, is very important. So that's what delegated proof of stake's about. Uh, fast transactions here, I've got 0 0.5 to 1.5 seconds. In Bitcoin, it can take 10 minutes to confirm a transaction. Ethereum's 15 seconds. Uh, things like BitShares are 1.5. Uh, Steam, I think, is at 0 0.5, and so is, uh, so is EOS. So, you know, there's lots of reasons behind that about why that's, why that's, and they achieve the mechanism differently, but essentially it means that I can transact very quickly. I don't have to wait on, uh, on fees and, and confirmations. In fact, last night I was doing a, a Bitcoin transfer. It took two hours to verify in the blockchain and I paid the highest fee which I could within my wallet. And I just had no control over that. Um, you know, so I, I was just waiting for the blockchain to verify my transaction. Um, that kind of sucks. That's not predictable. And if you're building a business on top of that, for money transfers, particularly what we're doing, it's, it's very difficult to be, able to, to be able to build a company which can rely on that kind of thing. So if we can do it in a second or half a second, then it certainly makes sense there. Uh, scalable, scalability is a big thing which we're talking a lot about these days uh, in the crypto community. People are talking about how do we scale Bitcoin, how do we make it support more transactions, how do we make it faster, and so on. Um, uh, BitShares, which was the first graphene blockchain, has been tested real in a production environment at 3,300 transactions per second. To put that in context, Bitcoin is something like, I think it's seven, uh, Ethereum's at maybe 14. Um, so there is a massive quantum leap there in terms of the ability to process transactions. There's also a trade-off as well. Um, if I have a database that only I verify, I could do a million transactions a second. But of course then all of the trust is on me. Whereas if you have a, a blockchain, you don't trust anybody, nobody trusts each other. So being able to achieve a fast transaction in 
a trustless manner is very important. So actually the technology that can improve transactions per second while maintaining a decentralized trust base, that is, I don't have to trust uh, anybody, is, is best. That's, that's the ultimate goal that you want to achieve. So essentially, if it's scalable already to over 100,000 transactions per second, which is what the technology is capable of, um, then you know, that's, the, that, that's, that's amazing. You know, that's already almost at Visa levels. Visa, in terms of transaction throughput, people talk about, oh, Bitcoin, what if everybody in the world used Bitcoin? You know, if everybody was doing one transaction every second, then Bitcoin wouldn't cope. It would stop because it can only do seven per second. Um, whereas Visa can do like 100 or 200,000. The difference is that Visa does authorizations and not settlement. There's a difference here. So Visa, basically, when I pay with my credit card, I am pinging Visa, their HQ, their database, going, hey, is, is George, has he got the money on his credit card? Yes or no? Okay, yes, he's got the money. It comes back with a yes. So that's actually pretty easy because there's a centralized database, one person, Visa, of who I have to contact for that. But Visa still need to transfer that money from, say, my bank or somebody else's bank to them or to a counterparty, maybe a merchant or something like that. That's called settlement. And that's where you have to rely on the banking system to do that. So that's where it's kind of slow and that's where there's a lot of bottlenecks. So when you're talking about interbank transfers between each other, SWIFT, everybody knows SWIFT. When you, ever do, you do a transaction overseas, you usually have a SWIFT code and that you know, code, you know, maybe your money takes a week or two to arrive. In fact, one time we went to one of the money transfer agents for uh, Hong Kong to Indonesia and they said it takes two weeks for a bank account transfer to arrive from here to, uh, to Indonesia, which is just ridiculous. So, um, so if, if you can remove a lot of those overheads and just, just make it easier to transact, that's, that's very important. Graphene also has support for smart contracts. I had a question before that uh, Graphene doesn't support smart contracts. It's not true. Um, smart contracts, it's been popularized by applications like Ethereum. Ethereum, everybody's talking about smart contract. Oh, smart contract, it's a very important thing. Okay, first thing is that there's very few applications that are really running live in production with a smart contract and actually need it, right? That's, that's the first thing. So the business case for if you need a smart contract or not, you know, I would be very skeptical. I would say that 90% of people who talk about smart contracts probably don't need to use one. That's the first thing. The second thing is it already, uh, the Graphene blockchain can support smart contracts already, but they're not programmable like Ethereum. Um, EOS is slightly different. It is like Ethereum where you can just make your own smart contract. Uh, but in BitShares, it basically the smart contracts are fixed. So you may have heard in Ethereum where people get hacked for, for a lot of money and there's a problem with the smart contract. That's because some of the, like for example, Parity was uh, la late uh, 2017, I think. They had a smart contract and uh, essentially there was a bug found in that contract. Somebody sent, you know, some, uh, I, I forget what it was. It was like some... Uh, error message or something to the smart contract that caused a bug uh, in the smart contract and basically that whole contract containing 170 million dollars worth of funds was compromised um, so it was it was hacked so you know that's that's pretty bad um, so it that's because it's programmable right like everybody can make their own smart contract is everybody the best security engineer in the world who never makes any faults not really so on the one hand, you can say, well, it's caveat emptor. It's like, look, if you, if you make a, a, a buggy smart contract, that's, that's on you. That, that sucks, but you should do it properly. That's one, I totally agree with that. But BitShares also says, look, we have a limited scope for smart contracts which you can build uh, on our platform. Same with EOS, same with Steam. And what we can do, you can only do within these parameters. It's still a smart contract. It's still on the blockchain, but it's fixed and it's, it's vetted and uh, you, you can't just sort of make up your own thing. So um, in some contexts, that's actually pretty useful. And we'll talk about that. The, the main context that I'm most excited about is pegged cryptocurrencies, stable coins, as you may have heard. So basically it's a coin which is pegged one-to-one -one with a national currency, like Hong Kong dollar, right? So if we could have a Hong Kong dollar on a blockchain, hey, that's awesome because you know, everything's transparent and provable and fast and all this kind of stuff. But if I have to make a smart contract for a Hong Kong dollar on, say, Ethereum, maybe I screw it up. Maybe I do some wrong coding or something like that and it, it just doesn't work. So um, if Bit BitShares has stablecoin smart contracts, but they're very fixed uh, in what they can do. We also have voting 
uh, which is very important as well. So every graphene blockchain has uh, voting and has for the last four years. So a lot of people, they're, they're raising like $30 million, $50 million on projects that are saying, oh, we, we do voting on the blockchain and we do all this cool stuff. Okay, this has existed for four years already. Um, so voting essentially is, you know, can we get everybody on the blockchain to, to vote on something? Um, now, in the easy context, you could think of, say, like a government issuing votes for an election or something. You want to be able to prove that everybody voted uh, everybody is unique. There's no like people pretending to be somebody else. So everything has to be unique. So that's a good uh, pro for a blockchain. You want it to be fast and transparent so everybody can see all of the votes. It's also very important. Um, so that's, a, that's a, an easy concept to grasp for, vo for voting. But how BitShares works as well and Steam and, uh, and EOS is they have voting for worker proposals. Basically, these are things where you can get paid by the blockchain to do stuff. So. Uh, in the case of, uh, say, BitShares, I think there's about 20 worker proposals already uh, up and running right now. Anybody with some BitShares can vote for a, a worker proposal. And the worker proposal could be anything. It's, uh, hi, my name is George. Um, I am going to run BitShares meetups or uh, EOS meetups in Hong Kong. And I think that's going to be really good. I want everybody to vote for me. And if my number of votes by all of the people who have BitShares reaches a certain threshold, then the blockchain will actually pay me money from the fees of which the blockchain generates. So actually my employer in that context is a, is a blockchain. It's, a, it's nobody else and, and I get paid directly to my wallet uh, from the blockchain. That's called a worker proposal and that's, that's pretty exciting for a development. So you know coding and open source projects and these kind of things is essentially you can get a development team that can be paid by the blockchain to do stuff. Um, so there's no, usually with open source projects, it's, it's always a question of who's going to pay for it. Yeah, it's good having free software and it's all open and everybody can see the code and blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, somebody has to invest time, sit down, spend hours coding and actually do stuff. And they need to get paid for that. So who's going to get paid for it? Well, if you have voting and the blockchain pays you, well, that's fantastic. You can work on your passion. You can keep it free and open source. And there's no vested interest that's going to be paying your check or or you know, might uh, not pay the money or might direct you to one area and not the other area. So uh, voting is, is very cool and, uh, and, and very important. But I think the main point is that it's actually real and all of this stuff has existed for years already. So graphene's not a new thing. Um, a lot of people are talking about how can we make Ethereum scale and Bitcoin scale. Okay, we're already at 3,300 transactions per second. We have been for four years. So you know, the, the answer's already there. Um, and that, that's why I'm particularly very passionate about graphene and, and some of the possibilities it can bring to not only our business, but, but other places as well. So um, we have a little bit of a, uh, uh, a, a comparison of block validation here for people that are techie. Um, this is to do with mining. Um, so I mentioned before mining, you know, what happens if I'm the only miner on the blockchain? You have to trust me, right? What if there's three of us in a room and, uh, and, and two of us decide to, to only mine certain blocks or only verify your transactions as opposed to somebody else's transactions. So that's, that's pretty bad. In, in Bitcoin, you have what's called a 51% attack threat. So if 51% of the network is owned or, or is mined and these miners collude, they're able to uh, change the outputs of future transactions. So that's, that's bad because then that devalues the whole point of having a trustless system. So you don't want people to own 51% of the network. Unfortunately, right now, uh, with Bitcoin, you have about four mining pools, which are pretty much all in China. So if the China government uh, you know, put everybody in jail and said, uh, point all of your keys to this address and, and only mine here, then that could be a technical possibility. Very unlikely, but, um, but, but that is a technical possibility. So um, you have a lot of different mechanisms to reduce the trust factor. And essentially what we're showing here is the delegated proof of stake model doesn't have this big threat of somebody owning 30% of the network or 20% of the mining power or anything like that. It's split evenly by however many people that they vote in, a minimum of 22. So, and those people that mine the blocks are chosen at random in order to approve the blocks. So there's no way that they can uh, game the system. So I think for those technically minded, that, that's pretty exciting and pretty important. Uh, point as well compared to, to some of the other consensus mechanisms. 
Uh, yeah, so I, I think I've touched on a little bit about this, and this is just a comparison to Ethereum. I chose, like, nothing. I, li I like Ethereum. I think it's great. Um, it's just that a lot of people are talking about Ethereum. A lot of people are building projects based on Ethereum. Um, but it's like when you actually compare the pros and the cons between it, I think that a lot more projects could be built on BitShares and will be better off. Um, in our case, we're using remittances, money transfers. And if we were to do money transfers on any other uh, blockchain, it doesn't really benefit us uh, that much. Whereas because I can create cryptocurrencies that are pegged to the value uh, of the national currency, then uh, that, that's just so much better for our business being able to transfer money. So, but you have all of these other use cases, stable coins, you know, multi-sig, decentralized exchanges. Um, I talk a little bit about decentralized exchanges just real quick. Um, when you, like, uh, in Hong Kong or elsewhere, there's exchanges, right? That's where you, you know, transfer your Bitcoin or trade Bitcoin, right? Exchanges get hacked all the time. Um, I think it's some crazy thing, like 70% of exchanges that have ever existed have been hacked, uh, some crazy number. So uh, it's a risk when you trade with somebody like an exchange. It's a, it's a company which holds your money and you hope that they're good for your money. Um, so that, that is a risk. So ideally, you want to remove that risk. You want to make sure that you are always in custody of your money. That's why people have created decentralized exchanges. Uh, I think 2018, you're going to be so, there's going to be so much more development in this space around decentralized exchanges or DEXs, whereby the software is the exchange. There is no company. It's just a software, a piece of software, which everybody just runs. It's like you download it, right? You have a wallet on your phone, you have a, a piece of software on your computer, and everybody who is you know, transacting between each other is the exchange. So that there actually is no need for a counterparty. You know, I have my money in my wallet, you have your money in your wallet, we can trade between each other. We don't need some uh, company being able to tell us if we can trade between each other. So this is actually really good for reducing risk, especially as a lot of institutional people are coming into the crypto space very soon. They want to reduce risk. They don't want to hold money at you know, some custody vendor who may or may not be good. So a, dis a DEX is, is very important and very exciting for that. Um, yeah, the first decentralized exchange was BitShares. Uh, BitShares has been around since 2014. Uh, we use it for money transfers. And uh, essentially, we can create a bit Hong Kong dollar, a bit rupee, a bit, you know, Tajik Samoni, a bit Sri Lankan rupee, anything. We can create a, a pegged asset for any commodity around in the world. Why is this important? Because it allows us to be able to transact in all of these different currencies. So if I want to get Sri Lankan rupee right now, who am I going to call? Uh, there, there is like nobody I can call. There's like probably some broker based in Sri Lanka and then I probably need a bank account there in order to transact in local currency. But if I can just buy BitRupi on a blockchain, that's so much better. So, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, a very exciting thing for businesses like us. Uh, and really, that, that's, that's what BitShares is really good at, is providing a, a, a fast DEX that uh, can support stable coins and it's production ready, ready to go. So uh, a lot of DEXs around the world are kind of like a proof of concept. We're in a beta. We're kind of, yeah, we're going to make this in the future, 10, 12 months from now. This, this is how it looks. It's, for traders, this will make sense. But, um, but you know, it, it's, it's pretty, pretty well developed and it's been around for a long time. So it, it's not something that's, you know, some new thing which somebody's just brought up and has like two features and two buttons. Um, it's, it's pretty well developed for people that are interested in that. So that's, that's very exciting uh, for us as well. But I think for those non-inclined to the tech side uh, in the audience, everybody here uses social media, right? Like Facebook, Twitter, uh, you know, WeChat, whatever it might be. Um, one of the problems with social media is, you know, advertisers wanting to get access to it, right? Like we've just seen with Facebook and the scandal where they're selling people's data. The reason for that is that Facebook is free. You know, how do they make money? They sell ads. That's pretty much what Zuckerberg said in front of the, uh, the US Congress as well. He said, we sell ads, that's what we do. So they have to have the data of all of their customers and then they sell the ads in order to make some money. But of course, you know, they have to harvest my data. They have to you know, scan everything that I'm doing. There's privacy concerns there. Um, and that's the only way that they can make money is to, is to do that. So is there a better way of which we can make money on social media without invading everybody's privacy and selling it off to random companies around the world. Well, Steam started a few years ago and we use Steam for our, for our blogs. Essentially what Steam is, is that it's a social media network where if you post something on social media and people like it or, or you know, approve it or retweet it or whatever, you'll earn some money. Simple as that. 
So where does the money come from? The blockchain issues it. So it's called content curation. And essentially people who have a lot of likes uh, and you know, from people that are reputable sources, and how do you judge reputable? It's because that source has you know, a lot of likes itself, a lot of people connect to it, a lot of people follow it, a lot of people are interacting with it in some way, clicking it, doing something. That's how you build a reputation. And when you build a reputation, you get coins. And when you get coins, you can vote with them. And when you vote with them, I, you, know, you can make money for blogging. So our first blog post that we did as a company, uh, it was probably like six months ago on Steam. We've been blogging for a long time just using our own website or whatever, right? But we didn't get any benefit from that, right? It's just a blog on our website. But it, we posted it on Steam and the first blog post we got, we made $300 on it. That's awesome. Um, you know, so everybody, that's US as well. So that's everybody anywhere in the world can be able to, to transact and, and make money on social media without giving up their privacy. So the blockchain is not some centralized entity selling your data to somebody else. You have always have access of your own data. And it also means that you're able to only really you know, reward positive content. If a lot of people like what you're going to do, then a lot of people will retweet it and, you know, uh, and, and promote it and so on. So that promotes good content. So you end up with a, a social media network which can promote good content. That's the idea behind Steam. And that's, that's really cool. I really like that concept. But again, that's running on graphene. Um, if you want to have a social network, there's people posting stuff like thousands of times a second, right? So you've got to have some sort of blockchain system that can handle that. You couldn't build that on Ethereum or you couldn't build that on any of these other things. Uh, you've got to build it on something which can cope with that scale. So that's why graphene was the, was the blockchain of choice for, for Steam. So that, that's a very cool concept as well. Um, We've got some pictures here of the default Steam website. So it's, it's kind of like you know, a Reddit, right? You've got your categories on the left-hand side that you might be interested in. You've got your blog posts. And you've also got you know, how much money somebody's making with that post. You know, these ones, $400, blah, blah, blah. They've got 200 people liking it. They've got 45 comments on this last one as well. So um, you, know, you can post whatever you want on these networks. Uh, and, and anybody can build on top of Steam. It's, uh, it's free and open, and you can build your own website based on it. In fact, there's one website called busy.org, and that's, that's the, the screen which we see. So when we blog our stuff online, you know, this is the interface which we see, this is everything. So I think it's, it's pretty, pretty easy to understand if, if you're familiar with social media and you know, content marketing and all this kind of stuff. You, know, you have you know, your company banner, your, your web page, your blog posts, you know, people that you follow, uh, you know, some information about the company, how many people follow you, and so on. So I, th I think that, that's pretty cool. So check out busy.org. That's another you know, great uh, Steam and Graphene project. Um, but of course, I think probably the big one uh, coming around in terms of market cap is, is EOS. You may have heard of that. Um, it's uh, actually run, well, the ICO was run by a company out of Hong Kong called Block One. And uh, we'll probably get some of those guys to, uh, to some of the meetups in the future. I think it's, they've raised like over a billion dollars, uh, something, some crazy number now. Um, and EOS, I think, is maybe top five uh, cryptocurrency. I'm not sure if we have it on here. Uh, do we have it? No. Um, so it, it's worth, I don't know, $20 billion or something right now. And it, basically, people see value in EOS because they think it's the next Ethereum. So EOS comes live, I think, in June. Right now, it's running in beta and sort of testing mode and these sorts of things. I'll reserve my judgment until the real thing is production ready. As anything, you know, I'm not going to build my business on a promise, um, and I, I. But it's uh, it's it's very exciting to watch, and uh, we're we're excited to see it's it's growing. But essentially, EOS is keeping all of the great benefits of graphene and being able to to make it a little bit more, uh, you know, user friendly for smart contracts as well. So just being able to program a smart contract like Ethereum uh, and be able to just sort of do do whatever you want with that smart contract. So. That's about EOS. Uh, we'll, we'll have some more in-depth meetups as well um, about, uh, about some of these projects because I, I think they probably warrant their own discussion. Um, in Hong Kong, this is the Hong Kong meetup. Uh, and essentially, as far as I can tell, there's sort of two major companies that are doing it. Correct me if I'm wrong. If there's other ones, please feel free to shout out. But um, you know, there's, there's us, uh, Spark, um, and there's uh, Block One as well with, with EOS. So we're building on BitShares, which is graphene. It was the first graphene blockchain. EOS is, is the new one and, and Block One are running that. I think they have an office maybe somewhere around Central. Um, and the, uh, so so that's, that's very exciting. So essentially, um, that's 
that's kind of all I want to say about these projects. And we have time for some question and answers. I already see some questions from the audience that I had before uh, that I was talking to, and there's probably some, some things which people have on their mind. But I think that gives you an overview that essentially what I'm trying to, to convey and what we're, what we're going to be promoting through these meetups is, you know, these are some of the cool projects that are around. And you know, why are these projects important? You know, what actual value do they bring to you? And if you're interested in a technology, why is the technology interesting to you? Uh, you know, why, why is this project? Why is it better than something else? Or you know, what are the what? Are, so we want to really highlight these things, talk about it in a little bit more depth. And uh, and I think tonight we're just going to sort of give an overview, but we'll have specific uh, meetups on you know a Dex, a stablecoin, a, a social network, smart contracts, these sorts of things. So uh, so feel free to yeah ask any questions. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's. That's it for this, this kind of presentation. Yeah. I mean, uh, there is a stable coin on Ethereum that I came across to make I'm sure you know about it, but that's not the point. The point is that with BitChess, how do you really create a stable coin back to Fiat? How do you bring Fiat on chain? Yeah, good question. So, so the question is, how do you actually make a stable coin? Right, like what, what makes it stable? Um, essentially, you have a, a coin, right? And okay, what's the most successful stable coin at the moment? People may have heard of Tether. Yeah, Tether, right? So Tether started, what, 18 months ago, two years ago. It's a company in the US um, who basically you deposit one USD to their bank and they give you a thing called a Tether and one, one USD for one Tether. Okay, it's, uh, it's stable, right? Because it's backed by our bank account. So we always have the money that we say we do in our bank because you just have to trust us they as Tether. They might not have it, exactly. Their bank might close them down. The company might run away with the money. We don't know. So there's so much trust having to be vested and it's called a counterparty risk in, in, uh, in projects like Tether. So if you create a stable coin, it's very easy to just make a coin and say, hey, yeah, it's valued at you know, one Hong Kong dollar and I, I back it because I'm a cool dude. Like, that, that's not good enough. So how do we make a stable coin? Uh, essentially in BitShares, and that was probably, I think one of the first projects to do it. There's some other ones, NewBits, uh, MakerDAO I think came a little bit later uh, than BitShares, but how it works is this. If I want one BitUSD, which is currently the most liquid, highest volume stable coin, number two is BitCMY, uh, number three is probably one of the other BitShares assets, and then it's something like, you know, uh, uh, MakerDAO or DAI or something like that. Um, Tether's obviously up there, but I don't really class that as a, as a stable coin because it's just kind of an IOU. Um, how do we make a BitUSD? If I have one BitUSD, I need to back it with collateral. That's the first thing. So I need to back it with two USDs worth of collateral on the blockchain. So in order to collateralize that one BitUSD, I need to deposit BitShares as a collateral. Now, BitShares is a currency. It's a cryptocurrency. It's about 24 cents at the moment. It's worth something. It has some value. Essentially, if I want to create one BitUSD, I have to back it with two BitUSDs worth of BTS, BitShares. So maybe that's uh, you know, eight BitShares, right? I have to back it with eight BitShares. So I just need to buy some BitShares wherever I get it from. It doesn't matter. And then I can create a thing called a BitUSD. Anybody can do that. So anybody can create a bit USD, a bit rupee, a, a, a bit whatever. That's the first point, is that every bit USD is collateralized and it has 200% backing. The next thing is, okay, what if the collateral is not always there? So the first thing is that this collateral is held in a smart contract that's public to everybody on the blockchain. So you don't need to trust me that I'm creating this bit USD and I have the money and all this. It's public, it's on the blockchain, you can see it. You can see the collateral, it's, it's measurable, and uh, nobody can influence that. It's locked in a smart contract. That's the first thing. Uh, but what happens if the value of that collateral changes, right? So if the price of BitShares goes up, I can, now, now my collateral is worth more. So I could create more BitUSD with the same amount of collateral, and hey, that's great. You know, I can create more BitUSD, that's all good. Uh, or I can withdraw some of my collateral and use that as, say, a profit. So that, that's, that's great if the price of the, of the bit shares grow, you know, goes up. What if the price goes down? If the price of bit shares goes down, then 
essentially there's a margin call. So what that means is a trader who created that one bit USD, as soon as his collateral ratio reaches 175%, the blockchain forcibly executes his position. It sells his, uh, his, his, uh, his bit shares and buys back bit USD from the market on the, on the DEX. So it means that if, if the collateral ever falls below a certain point, you know, it's always bought back from the market. So it means that there's, there's this mechanism in there which doesn't require a company, you know, to enforce it or anything like that. The blockchain enforces it and, and it's set and fixed. So essentially that's how BitShares does collateralized assets. Now, in terms of MakerDAO as well, uh, MakerDAO is achieving much of the same thing uh, on Ethereum, but it's, it's trying to do a lot of stuff that BitShares has already done and pioneered on a less scalable system. So I think MakerDAO, when, when I looked over the documentation, I, when it first started, I think it was a basket of coins. So it actually wasn't one-to-one -one with USD. It was like, you know, they had a bunch of different, which you could actually deposit the collateral and, and peg it to. I think now it's changed and, uh, you know, how it, um, uh, yeah, it's one-to-one it's -one with USD at the moment. But an another key point is, is how does the blockchain know what a bit USD is worth? The blockchain doesn't know. It's just this dumb thing, right? It's just this software which just executes transactions. It does this stuff. It doesn't know what's happening on Bloomberg today about the, the USD price. So the question is, how does it maintain this one-to-one -one value? Well, people all around the world are running these nodes which are providing price feeds for the BitUSD. So all of these people are able to provide a price, be, a price feed of what is the price of one BitUSD to one BitShare. And why would people do that? Well, it's because they get paid, of course. So it's like a, it's like a block producer, a witness. Um, so they're able to get paid for doing something useful to the network by telling everybody what is a BitUSD worth? You know, what, what, is, what is the blockchain? You know, what, what does it think that it's worth? So a median is taken of these people who are providing price feeds. And if anybody is providing a bad price feed or something like that, they can get voted out through the voting mechanism. That's why voting is very important as well. So you can't just go and create a million bots and then tell it a wrong price because everybody will just vote it out and then it won't be valid anymore. Um, so you know, that, that's another a key point as well, is that's how the, the blockchain actually knows how, what the price is. So we're building a lot of, uh, everything that we're doing is gonna be based on BitShares. We're currently making the switch right now. So we're, we've been using Bitcoin to transfer money for four years already. We're currently building the tech in order to uh, switch everything to BitShares. I wanna be able to transact in BitHKD to, to BitRupee, to BitPHP, to Bit anything. And that, that's what essentially what we're doing. So we're, we're trading a lot of the, uh, doing a lot of the trading logic. So, um, so that's, that's very cool. Um, we're, and we're building everything on, on graphene. Back to your stablecoin situation, does it also depends on how often the rebalancing or how quick this rebalancing is done to make sure this, the coin is stable? So the price feed uh, happens at a time period which is every block essentially. And every block is, uh, is like 0.5 of a second or, or one second. Um, so that's where it's getting information about the price. So it, it's getting that all the time. Now, one of the risks for a stablecoin is not risk-free. Um, one of the risks is that what if the price tanks like 80% in a second or goes to zero in a second, then if the blockchain tries to execute everybody's orders and buy back the bit USD, which is with the underlying collateral, there's not gonna be enough orders in the market to do that because the price is worth nothing. So that's called a black swan event. And BitShares has that, MakerDAO has that. That's always one of the risks to be aware of. The good thing is that BitShares is you know, in terms of liquidity, it's $800 million market cap. Um, you know, it's in the top, top list on, on CoinMarketCap. It has a lot of liquidity backing it. There's trading volumes of, I think just on the decentralized exchange itself, it's today it was like $40 million, uh, something like that, which is, which is pretty decent. It's been upwards, I've seen it of $160, $180 million a day. That's on the, on the DEX. On things like Binance and the centralized exchanges, it's a lot more than that with BitCMY and these kind of things. So. Uh, there is a lot of liquidity now backing it to reduce the likelihood of a black swan event. How, how does a uh, busy lot work? How is that different? Yep. So busy. There we go. Busy is basically just a front end for Steemit. So Steemit is a blockchain. It has a bunch of APIs. It allows you to post stuff like a social media, uh, you know, post on the blockchain, social network, blah blah blah. You can do that at Steemit.com which is the, the website which has been used since ever. 
or you can just build your own. You can build your own website that looks pretty and looks nice, but still interacts with the blockchain the same way. So busy.org does that. It's just a nicer front end for, for the Steam blockchain. We prefer to use to use busy. It's it's quite nice. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. That there is a lot of hype around EOS currently. Um, that's pretty relevant in the price. It's like tripled in the last uh, two weeks. So um, th there is a lot of interest in EOS and, and the benefits it can bring. Uh, it can bring. Um, however, I don't want to risk building my company on a blockchain which is not proven yet in production. So if it's proven, if it has documentation, if it's not an experiment, if it's not a beta. You know that I really want to see some some track record first. So that's like I'm excited about EOS. If it succeeds, we'll we'll integrate it in some way, I'm sure, or or make use of it in some way. But I think at the moment, it's it's I'll reserve my judgment till it's been actual battle tested in production. Um, and and at the moment, I'll just you know BitShares has been around for four years. It is battle tested. And all the currencies exist and and trading exists and blah blah blah. So I'll build it on what already exists. And uh, it's, EOS could be great. Come June, it'll be very exciting to see it launch. Uh, but uh, I, I'll, I'll reserve my judgment until then, until it's, it's been live for a, a while yet. So it's just a personal opinion, that, that, that's all. So, uh, EOS is uh, running on Graphene, right? And uh, you can buy it applications on top of EOS. Is it uh, effective competing in Graphene? Competing with? So EOS is graphene. It's just a more updated version of the graphene technology. So graphene started with BitShares. That was version one. Version two was essentially Steam. And there were some modifications done to the underlying blockchain. And version three is, is essentially EOS. So it's still graphene. It's just like different versions of it you know, in, in usage. So I, they're not competitors. They try and do different things. Like EOS is not trying to be a social network. Um, there's talk about EOS having a DEX but it doesn't have anything like that at the moment, nowhere near the functionality required. So BitShares is still gonna have its niche. So I think, you know, BitShares is gonna do its thing, Steam's gonna do its thing, EOS is gonna do its thing, uh, and that's great. You know, they, they each, each fulfill a different, you know, product niche. Yeah, so uh, you Anything else? There's, uh, there's food down the back, and I, I don't know if we've run out of our tab yet uh, at, at the front, so um, feel free to, to, to make, make use of that. <laughs> cool, thank you. Uh, just before I begin, so I'm George. We've got some of our team members here tonight. We've got Maxine, uh, co-founder of Bitspark. We've got Kristen, we've got Michelle down the back as well. And we've got Guillaume hiding around here somewhere as well, so out, out the front. Uh, so feel free to come up to us if you've got any questions, happy to ask. But there's also very knowledgeable people in this room. So uh, yeah, just have fun, uh, make use of the time. And uh, thanks, thanks a lot for coming along. I hope to see you all very soon. Okay.